Hello, everybody. It's Stephen and Walter here for another episode of So Chatty for May the 19th, 2023. And I just said to Walter, this is our 100th episode of So Chatty. Maybe. It could actually be 101 or 102 because I think along the way I might have made a mistake on the count and possibly, you know, screwed it up. But for all intents and purposes, it has been 100 episodes plus. Put it that way. Hard to believe. 100 episodes is so chatty. Wow. We should have a party. Woo! Okay, there's Walter's party face. <laughs> Whatever. Okay, so uh, we're going to respond to some comments this week on a variety of topics. We thought we would do that uh, as well. But before we get that, just show you what I've been working on. So these are bits and pieces for the Healing Waters uh pattern this is the one with the indigenous fabric actually the indigenous fabric is from northcott and it's called healing waters and these are the panel pieces that you have to cut up and it's a patty patchwork uh design pattern i swear the woman never makes pat never makes a quilt from her original designs herself because oh there's problems with this one too and i analyzed this one a long time i did something i seldom do with a pattern but because I've done one of her patterns before and had nothing but hell with it, I decided I would read this one very carefully and I would make uh, notes and draw arrows and diagrams all over. And I have. And one thing I discovered was she said that you were to use these two, this pat, this panel for this. And then I got looking at it. You notice one is a little bigger than the other one. Disregard the one other small pieces hanging there. And they both are from the same panel. But they're not supposed to be. There is another panel that looks slightly different from this. And when I was looking at her measurements for squaring up the panel pieces, uh, they were not working. Well, all on that the... one that looks like the one on the left, all that looks like is the bottom cut off the one on the right. Yeah. Where were you when I just explained that that's oh. not the one oh, okay. that you should be using? It's a different panel. But yeah. she put the number of the panels in her pattern and they're both the same number so i did a little research and discovered there is another panel with exactly the same number she used but with one difference they add another number to the panels one of these patterns is, or panels is called i96 or something like that and the other one is i something else she sort of neglected to put that in in her instructions Mm -hmm. And when you look at her diagrams and things, they you look at it and you think, well, wait, isn't that just a piece out of this one? That's what I thought at first, but no, it's not. So I went looking for that panel because I've got all this fabric, but I don't have that particular panel. Yeah, not easy to get. I found it in one Canadian spot to get it out in BC somewhere, or Alberta, and the panel was... $18 and some odd cents. And then it was another $15 or no more now. It was another $17 or $18 to have it shipped by Canada Post. And which actually, my way of thinking, that place has got really high uh, postage because these weigh nothing and they can can actually be fit into a well, standard. Well, obviously, size they envelope. must have a standard rate regardless yeah to well a certain amount well you could get free shipping if it was over so much yeah. money but i just needed the panel so it was going to cost me 30 dollars in total for the panel i said no i have three of these panels i'll make them work and that's what i'm doing but there's other things in her patterns like she insists upon using eighths of an inch for everything i'm oversizing those and cutting them down trimming them because i'm not fooling around with eighths of an inch, like two and seven eighths to make flying geese. And you got to make 176 flying geese with this thing. And no, I'm making the little part. You do four geese at a time uh, technique. And that means having two, what she wants you to do is have two and seven eighths inch squares on a five and a quarter inch piece. Five and a quarter inch piece I can live with. Two and seven eighths, no, I cut them at three. And then I'm just trimming them down once the flying geese are made with it. You know, this this shows me something. I'm learning that people who design patterns, 
if they have eighths of an inch in them, it's because they're doing them mathematically and they're probably using something like EQ8 or whatever, which will do all of those eighths of an inch. But what they're not taking into consideration is how our rulers are marked. Yes, some rulers have eighths of an inch marked on them, but with all the other numbers and lines that are on it, it is very, very easy to cut the wrong size with those. And yes, there's tricks you can use. You can use a piece of masking tape down the line or some of that other specialty tape that you can get, which is basically colorful masking tape, uh, or painter's tape, and do all that. But you know why? When you can easily bump it up to the next whole number and then just tell your person she might, to trim she it. might out. also be a clothing sewer because everything's in a single clothing. I don't know what she is. That's Patty's patchwork. I can't say too little about her designs. And I went looking to see if there was corrections to this pattern. Went to her website and found, yeah, every pattern she's ever put out pretty much, with the exception of this one. Lists of corrections. Which, what does that tell you? That tells you she doesn't, she does not make. When she puts out a pattern, she doesn't make the quilt from it. And the quilt that I had a lot of trouble with about a year ago, and I said never buy one of her patterns again, I went on, she put up a series of YouTube videos, episodes on how to do that quilt. She didn't follow her own instructions. She was cutting pieces differently using different equipment in the whole bit. I know that at my local quilt store, when I went in at that time a year ago talking about that pattern, they said, oh, we've had so many complaints about those patterns and that we won't carry her patterns anymore. And she apparently is a designer for patterns using Northcott's fabrics for them. And I did write to Northcott and, and said to them, you know, do, do your designers actually test their quilts before you publish the pattern? And here's why I'm saying this. Never got an answer. Nothing. I didn't expect I would uh, about it. But yeah. But so you're going to say, well, if you have all this problem with her patterns or thing, why'd you buy another one? Not because I'm an idiot, because I liked the what the pattern, the finished pattern looked like. And I could not find anything comparable for this line of fabric. Could I have made it up myself? Yes. I could have, but I decided, well, if there's a pattern already written, why go through the hell? And uh, yeah, we'll see. So far, it's going along fine, thanks to the fact that I analyzed and drew diagrams all over the pattern. But you shouldn't have to do that. You really shouldn't. If you're spending like $18 on a pattern, uh, you you expect that it, it's going to be written in a way that works, right? At least I do. Maybe I'm demanding too much, too too demanding. I don't know. But anyways, I'd share that with you. The other thing I'm going to show you, if I can get my cursor to work. Okay. So, um, we went to a place in uh, BC down in the Abbotsford area, and you saw the video, it called Chitter Chatter. And we were really thrilled with Chitter Chatter, with their store. I mean, at first we got there and there were goats, right? <laughs> you remember that video? And um, it was in a house, in the basement, a finished basement of the house. But it was a fantastic store. It had all kinds of things. Well, about a week or so ago, in the mail, I got a gift certificate from them for 50 bucks because they saw my review of their store and wanted to show that they appreciated that. And I thought, wow, okay. So I went to their online store and I bought some fabric, a couple of bundles of fabric and uh, I think a layer cake, more than $50 worth, but that was okay. But they, I, I bought the bundles because they were boutiques and they were on sale. Now, this is where Walter will come in to this and make sure that you, he puts the idiot version on what I'm going to tell you. Two bundles of batiks. I love batiks. They were on sale. They had different number, different name, slightly different name. I was looking at the picture. They both said Banyan batiks. Okay. 
Banyan Shadows Batik by Northcott Fat Quarter Bundle six on sale for sixty two twenty nine regularly eighty eight ninety eight. This is from their web page. Yeah, look at the picture. Okay, the other one was eleven seventy one Banyan Batiks, regular price ninety two ninety eight on sale for seventy five fifty nine. Mind you, this bundle has 24 fat quarters in it. This bundle is listed as having yeah, 23. Take a look at those two pictures now, side by side. All right. They do like they may look like they might be similar, but they had different names. So I'm thinking, well, maybe there's they'll go together, but there's a slight variation. All right. I don't think that was an illogical conclusion to come to. They didn't have exactly the same name. They did not have exactly the same price. They did not have the exact same number in the bundle. And they did not have the exact same sale price or regular price. So my conclusion is these must be different in some way. But I love batiks. So I bought both of them. And they came. And here's what I got. There's the two bundles. Yes, they are the same, except one bundle has 24 fat quarters, one bundle has 23. And I bought some chroma uh, layer cake, but that's beside the point. I'm talking about these bundles. Well, I thought, did they mix something up? Of course, immediately Walter takes their side and he goes right up onto the computer and he prints these pages out and goes, look, they're both the same, they're both the same, they're both the same. Well, actually, they had a third bundle too with another name and another number. And they had the same batiks in it as well. Okay. My point is this. Would you not think that they are different? Because we all know when they take pictures of things, they don't necessarily translate on your monitor exactly the same they do in real life. So maybe there was a subtle difference between the two. I could not tell. Am I disappointed I got two bundles the same? No, I am not. I love them. They're batiks. They will not come amiss. I am happy about that. But I wrote to them and I said, told them just what I told you now. And, and, it's, and so uh, I got to see what they would say back again. I mean, they were very generous. They sent me that $50 gift certificate. So I'm not looking a gift horse in the mouth. But I thought, well, somebody else might be, if I'm confused, somebody else might be even more confused if it happens to them. And maybe they should know because maybe what happened was whoever packed the order got mixed up a little bit. I don't know. There's lots of things that could go wrong. So I wrote to them and told that. And I said, you know, I wrote a nice note. I said, just telling you this because I said, you know, to me, it won't come amiss because I can never have too many batiks kind of a thing. But I thought you want to know. They wrote back and told me, yeah, they're both the same. Okay, what do I do with that information? Well, I wrote back. Okay, thanks for clearing that up for me. What I expected was, okay, best case scenario. Oh, we're so sorry. We got those two are very much alike and we got them mixed up when we were putting them in or, or whatever in your order uh, and everything. So, you know, um, if you want, we'll just send you another bundle or make that up or something like that. Now, they've already were very generous. So I didn't really, I, if they wrote that back to me and said that, I was say, don't worry about it. Actually, what they probably should have done in the store is when you order with an online order, they probably should have contacted you and say, um, both those uh, bundles are almost exactly the same. Do you still want them? Yeah. If someone had been on the ball enough for that, yeah. but that might be asking too much. I think what's happened is because when we were in that store, they had a lot of bundles. And I think they make up their own bundles from their fabric. And I have a feeling that because these were both on sale, they've been sitting in the store for a while and they're trying to get, you know, make some room. So they put them on sale. But maybe one bundle was made back months before the other one. And whoever made up that bundle put it into the computer with one name. And maybe used a shortened version of the name. Didn't use the whole name in it. And then the other one got put in at some point in time. 
either before or after with the full name. So I don't know with it. Now, am I saying that I'll never shop with them again? No, I'm not. I still recommend them. I think they're a great store. I, um, I, I think the way they wrote that message back to him, oh, they did say one has 23 and one has 24. Well, then that would mean then that one fat quarter, the one, the extra fat quarter, we worked out the math, was $13 more to get an extra fat quarter in the same fat bundle. I mean, fat quarters have gone up in price, but they haven't gone up to fit thirteen dollars for a fat. So quarter. that would question. Um, they aren't very um, atten uh, attentive as to their pricing. No. So yeah, I could make a big deal about this. I am not. I thought it was very very nice of them to send me that gift card. Um, that was totally unexpected and a surprise. And they do have lots online to choose from. Um, you know, I've reviewed their store and the whole bit uh, with it. So, yeah, I definitely would say that I will certainly deal with them in the future as well. It's, it's just, just that maybe you should be aware that uh, uh, they make uh, so they may make different fat quarter bundles um, with the same fabric. So that they may different. they may have different name. If it looks the same in the picture and you don't want the two to the same, then maybe you should write them an email before you place the order and ask about it. Don't make an assumption. So, but according to Walter, I'm more of an idiot because of that. Because you can see they're just about the same. They're just the same. I'm gonna wait. What can't you see about this? They're just the same. Enough said. Okay. So, anything else on here to show you? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Talking about other little problems. Actually, I have more problems to tell you. So it's it's that kind it's of the week. problem week. Problem week. Okay. See this box of bobbins? <laughs> you know I buy my bobbins uh, by the gross lot. Um, they're pre-wound. They're from Monfil. I've talked about Monfil many, many times. I love Monfil. Uh, and I love these bobbins. I have never had any problems with these bobbins until one box back a while ago. The bobbins look like they had been overwound. Okay, not a big problem, just a little bit of an annoyance, which meant that when I was putting them, and I use these a lot in, well, I use them in all my machines, in, all, in my domestics, and I use them in my embroidery machine. Um, and they, they work fine for both uses. But the overwhelmed ones while I was using them in my embroidery machine were causing things to like thread breaks or also pulling some of the upper thread down in the fabric into the machine. And then so it was causing me a little havoc. The way I got around that was I would wind off when I put a new bobbin in about, I don't know, 20, 30 meters, something like that off them. I know some of you out there are going to go, oh, my God, what a waste. Well, you know. It's $25 for 144 of these suckers. So, you know, you, you're really not wasting anything at that. But I on the on the box that that happened to, I did write to Johnny, who's the, I guess, owner, manager, of whatever, Monfil, and I just mentioned it to him. And Johnny leapt right in and said, oh, he says, sorry about that. I'll, I'll investigate what the problem is. Like, I'm thinking, because they get them from someplace. I suspect they get them from China, but I don't know that for sure. And uh, maybe, you know, he want, would not want to know this because other people might complain, especially people who've never dealt with Monfil before and it might be their first time. Um, he might want to investigate it to see if there's more of a problem in that. I have since found to date that I'm the only person that has said anything. So <laughs> just me. But anyways, I, I make them work. It's fine. It's just a minor annoyance. It's no big deal. Wouldn't stop me from buying them. In fact, I bought four boxes of them in so the past. three of them were fine it was just the one box right? yeah let's jump right ahead okay so the they came in a big box uh the three four boxes that you see like these here um and when they come they're sealed all right and they're all nicely laid out they don't look like what i'm showing you here but when i opened up the the main box that had all the smaller boxes in it there was one box that had busted open and there were bobbins all inside the bigger box. And this is what the box looked like. And those are all the loose ones that we pulled out. And Walter noticed that it came by Canada Post, but there was a Canada Post plastic bag wrapped around the parcel itself, which 
means that somehow the box had opened up um, in transit. Now, whose fault is that? Is it the fault of the shipping department of Monville? Was it the fault of Canada Post? Um, whatever. But I, I let Johnny know um, that these were kind of all over the place. And like I cleaned up the threads that were all falling off them because I also suspect these ones are a little overwound too. And I told him that. And uh, Johnny said, oh, he said, when we ship them out, whoever's packing the order, order is supposed to put tape around those boxes so they don't open up. So, okay, so that tells me there's a problem in the shipping department. So he said he would be talking to them and making sure that they do that and whatnot. He was apologetic for it. And he said on my next order, he'd throw in a free spool of thread. I don't need a, three, a free spool of thread because I own all of their thread. And I don't use it much of it now. So, um, anyways, he knows about it. And I, it's a minor, another minor annoyance. I can work around it. but. If you don't, my philosophy is this, if you have a problem and you don't let them know about it, then the problem could continue because they may not realize there is a problem. So, and I like Monfil a lot. You've heard us talk about Monfil. And so I don't want other people by our yeah, recommendation I mean, go and have a bad experience. I've ordered lots of stuff from them and I've never had a problem with it. And this is pretty much one of your first problems. Yeah, I've never had a problem before. Yeah like that but as i said i can work around this i can make it work and i told johnny that but you know they might want to look at this because it might disturb other people more so and it might lose some business for them okay so i think well what else oh yeah <laughs> my surgery's in getting fixed why well that was my fault i did the one thing you're never supposed to do with the surgery don't use pins with your serger when you're sewing because if you run over a pin the likelihood that you will break a blade the cutting blade is very likely and guess what i did but the thing was this i never use pins i always use wonder clips except for this one time i got this bright idea that i was putting straps into i was making some little bags using the serger and i was putting the straps in the handles and i thought mm, actually the pins will hold the strap a little straighter than the wonder clip but i said to myself make sure before you get to the blade part you take the pin out yeah squirrel went by clunk no more blade so it's in getting a new blade put on it over at ultimate song uh as we speak and then yesterday my big iron, my my reliable iron, started to smell weird. Like someone was taking a crayon or a piece of plastic and melting it down on the iron itself. Um, to the point that the fumes were so bad, I had to open a window and a door and air out the house. Walter noticed it as soon as he woke up. Uh, I smelt it all the way upstairs to the bedroom. And... Could not figure out what was happening with it. So I uh, called up Reliance and said I had this. And they said, well, they have a whole method where you can ship it to them. And they'll ship it back and whatever for servicing and, and everything. But they're only in West End of Toronto. So we decided today to go in there just before we started doing this. And so we took it in, told the guy. He kind of looked at me like, oh, smell. That sounds weird. Anyways, he took it in his workshop, filled it up with water, heated it all up, got it going. And he comes back and he says, I don't smell anything. He says, I don't have a really good sense of smell. So I went back with him. Nope, no smell. Wasn't doing it. Now, he did show me, though, that there was uh, my one of my hoses that goes into the iron. It was wearing out. It had frayed a little bit. And whatnot but we don't think that would have caused the smell but anyways i decided they're going to flush it all out and everything and i figured it's in there anyways let's have the thing serviced and you know all that kind of thing and if i get it back home and it starts that smell again then well I'll have to deal with it at that point in time but it was weird hadn't done anything different with it i it was working fine it was still working it's just that there was 
toxic chemical smell coming off of it that, you know, might kill you. So anyways, we'll see what happens. So yeah, it's been an eventful week for equipment. It always happens. Everything always happens in threes. Yeah, because they opened it up and looked all in the inside yep. and they couldn't find. They looked inside the iron part and they looked inside the, the boiler. Uh, boiler. And they couldn't find anything that where there was any kind of electrical. Um, but it wasn't an electrical burn or... smell. It, it was definitely a, the smells like plastic. Yeah, burnt but, plastic or burnt crayon or burnt whatever. wax or something. But I, you know, no, I didn't have crayons on it or whatever. But anyways, we'll see. I don't know how long it's going to be in there for, but I don't think it'll be that long. But this is a long weekend. It's okay. I have other irons I can use. Okay, so that was the events of that week. Uh, we had sewing with Stephanie and Stephen on Wednesday. It went for most of the day. Sometimes does. Uh, if, if Stephanie or I don't have anything else to do, then we're just so away. Um, this Saturday, you probably already know, because I've announced it already on the other videos, and I sent out the email to those on the mailing list. Pop-up sew day this weekend, May 20th, Saturday, starting at 8 a.m. Come and go as you please, whatever. Now, I do know here in Canada, it is the long weekend um, as well, so that may affect some people. Uh, you know, a lot of people open up their cottages this weekend or go places, do things, whatnot. But uh, if you're not going anywhere, then come join us for the pop-up so day. And I did an interview this week with Shannon Way from Slay Arts. That's already up. That went up on Tuesday. Um, it's a great interview. And I am thinking that Shannon might make a wonderful guest speaker at the next retreat. I haven't talked to her about this yet, but I think she's right into foundation paper piecing. She's trying to uh, become a certified instructor for legit kits as well. Which, if you don't know what legit kits are, well, where you been? They're they're definitely on trend, as they say, right now. You need to keep looking at the bobbins, or maybe you prefer looking at the bobbins and us, whatever. Um, but yeah, and I've got another speaker already lined up too. I'm not going to reveal that. So I've, I'm looking around. I'm getting. I'm starting to do some initial planning for the next retreat. Now the next retreat will not be until tail end of October. I haven't got an exact date figured out yet, but I will. And when I do, you will know. Okay. So what we thought we'd talk about today is there's a lot of comments uh, that come up on all of the videos we put up during a week. And we don't often um, get a chance to reply to them. And I have to admit, if you want to reply to a comment and you have to do it in writing, well, I'm lazy. I'd rather just talk about it. And that's what we're going to do. So I've got them sort of in categories, depending on what topic they were talking about. And uh, so this these first few are about in reference to quilt making and sewing. And uh, we were talking last week about the fact that about making a quilt for somebody and how difficult that can be and all that. Well, Elaine has a solution to this. And I, I want to read this because this is really good. Elaine says, and Elaine, I believe, is in Australia. She says, I do not do commissioned quilts. However, I often have friends who will ask that I do something for them because a baby is coming or they want something for their daughter or whatever. In fact, I'm doing one now for one of my besties, which she intends to be a gift for her daughter-in-law for Christmas. But I have a couple of rules. I have three patterns I'm willing to do. Simple ones, nothing complicated. Choose one of these three patterns or I will recommend someone else. They are simple scrap quilts, so I volunteered the top fabric if color is not an issue, and they're happy with whatever is in my scrap box. If I'm willing to go to the distance with it, I will tell them to buy the batting and the backing, and I will quilt. No charge to my friend. I won't make a full bed quilt for anyone, even a bestie. I have made a large top for a close friend and sent them along to buy backing and batting and, did, and take it to a long arm. With those basic rules in operation in my sewing room, I'm content and friends who want more go to someone who does it for a living. Well, you want to know something? I think that's really good. You're putting parameters on it. You're taking the stress off yourself. And if this does not suit that person's needs, then they can go somewhere else. And I think there's nothing wrong with saying that. So I like that um, from Elaine. I thought that made a lot of sense. What do you think? Yeah, actually, that sounds pretty good. And she sounds like she's being pretty reasonable. Yeah. 
you know, she has three designs, pick one. I'm going to use scraps unless you have a specific color. So one way to get rid of her scraps and it doesn't cost anything. And she can actually give this to the person for nothing. Yeah. You know, in a way uh, that if she wants to. So I think that was an excellent idea. Um, so obviously Elaine has had a lot of experience with from the past with people making quilts for other people and the hell you may go through. Um, Katie Crafts wrote about uh, badly written patterns. She said badly written patterns with uh, fud, she's got fudsy, I think she means fussy measurements are a hassle. Good luck with your quilt. I'm sure designers are not quilters. I think there's some truth to that. I think there is a group out there that all they do is design patterns and somebody else sews them. I mean, you have that in garment sewing, isn't there? Do you have testers? Yeah, like, testers. Uh, usually what happens is a uh, designer creates a pattern and they have uh, a bunch of uh, volunteers that will test their pattern type of thing. Um, and she will get, they, they, uh, they often give uh, perks to the volunteers, you know, like a free pattern or some things like that to, uh, to, as an incentive to test the pattern. But most of the time they have somebody to test the pattern to go through the pattern and give feedback as to how well it's written and stuff like that. Yeah, well, I think that's a really good idea because I swear there are, it's not just that one I was talking about a few minutes ago. I have run into a couple of other patterns over time that are just now, poorly written. Now there is sometimes um, like a designer may create a pattern and, and test it themselves and, and, and write up instructions. But if they sell the pattern to a, a big corporation like Vogue or, or one of the uh, big corporations, Vogue may rewrite the instructions based on their standards. Yeah, you said um, that Ron so, Collins had that problem. Yeah, Ron Collins had that problem. Um, he uh, he uh, designed patterns. He'll design patterns and write up his own instructions. But then uh, the company that he's, he, in this case, Vogue, sold, he sold it to. He actually sells the pattern. He doesn't get a commission on the on the pattern or anything like that. He sells the pattern to the company. The company writes the instructions. So the instructions may not always be great according yeah. to the uh, the pattern type of thing, or may not always be what the designer had intended it to be. Well, this all goes back to that golden rule that I tend to break: read your pattern from beginning to I mean, end. You said uh, this one, this patty or whatever yeah. patterns, patty, um, patchwork. Patty's patchwork patterns don't work very well, but she may submit a pattern and maybe the company that publishes it changes the uh, the instructions. Well, that's I don't a know. Possibility. I don't know. Possibility. I don't know the process, but either way. But when, she, when you see a whole list of corrections in all of her patterns, yeah. you know, that really reeks of not a good pattern writer i mean pattern writing is not easy if you've ever tried to write a quilt pattern it is not easy to do because you have to rule of thumb i would think would be write your pattern from the point of view that it's going to be someone who's a novice do not assume they know anything you would think you would think that they would write a pattern they would create the pattern write the pattern assemble it themselves Right, either that or assemble up first and then write the pattern. That's a, I assume, what normally happens when they, when they write a pattern, but also get some people to test the pattern. Yeah. Well, no, I don't think you can assume that what they won't normally do is they put the quilt together, then they write the pattern from that, because there's electric quilt. Yeah. And there are other programs out there as well that you can go on and you can sketch it all out and play with it and adjust the measurements and the whole bit. And it's like, too bad they don't know. have written on the side of the panel tested by five people or something like that. Yeah. Well, anyways. Um, Marina. Marina? Marina. 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 Uh, wrote, I must have missed it. How did your brother and sister-in-law receive your table runner and napkins? Well, they seemed to like them. And we went over there for dinner after I'd given them to them the next day and they were on the table. <laughs> now that might be just to, you know, 
because we gave them to them and they maybe never it may not be uh, her color pattern no because they were a bit bold and i don't know but anyways they said they liked them and that's all that matters okay i don't care what they say afterwards i'm not there to hear it um uh diane says super episode love your honesty i've not brought my machine in for yearly maintenance mainly because they are running excellent and i have heard so many stories of people give, getting them back with more things wrong than went in for. I keep my machines very clean and hope for the best. Bob and Erie is cleaned almost every time I turn on one of my machines. Have a great weekend. Yeah, okay. Um, I've heard other people say that they, you know, they're kind of shell shocked. Uh, they take in the machine to have a repair done, and it comes up, comes back maybe with the repair done, but other problems with it too. Well, that would say that whoever is fixing the machine doesn't know what they're doing with it. So you need to shop around in that case uh, because that's not good. That's not good. But yes, you have to have your machines serviced. If you're using them a lot, you need to spend the money. And this is what people seem to hate. They resent spending money on maintenance for a machine. Well, think about it. We've had this discussion before. You're dropping three, four thousand and up dollars on a machine. It behooves you not to take it in at least once a year or every year and a half and have it, you know, tuned up, cleaned up, all that kind of stuff. And if it costs you a hundred, a hundred and twenty-five, even hundred and fifty, it's money well invested as long as you've got a good technician or a service guy. Yeah, well, yeah, a lot of person. times, like with appliances, like uh, appliances or something. I've seen people say, "Oh, I, oh, do you know where I can get this uh, this appliance fixed cheap or something like mm -hmm. that?" And they expect to pay, you know, twenty, thirty dollars for a fix. Well, most technicians make forty and over dollars an hour. How can they possibly service a machine for twenty or thirty dollars? Yeah. yeah. And then there's parts if you need parts and things like that on top of it. Like taking my iron in today, it's already cost me money. It cost me $65 to have it analyzed to see what the problem is. But I had to leave it there and they're going to put that new tube on that. It's $125 an hour for that. But if you're leaving it there for it to be serviced, they will credit you the $65 against whatever the final amount is for the, the fixing of your, your iron. Um, I have no idea what this is going to cost me. Um, but I have a feeling it's going to cost me a minimum. It's going to cost me over $100, probably. It might not. They may only charge me for one hour of labor, but then I'll have to pay for the part, whatever. I don't imagine that part that he's going to put on it is really all that expensive, but then I don't know. But it's... A six hundred dollar iron, so you know, and it's, it's not working right. So I got to spend the money. It's simple as that. Um, Cheryl wrote great points on several levels. I would frequently run into ladies who always had to pay the newest high end sewing machine, had to buy sorry the newest high end sewing machine as soon as they could physically get one. They never had learned to do basic things on their current machine. I would say they have. They had more money than brains. A significant other should never buy any machine for another unless they're specifically asked for that machine. Hence why some sit in boxes forever. And this was in response to, you know, why do people leave new equipment in the box for years before they ever get to it? And that's true. There are people who have more money than brains and they got to have the newest, whatever. And they haven't even learned how to use the features on their other I and they one. they end up never using those features yeah. or all they do is straight like any your quilter all you do is straight stitch most of the time you don't use all the uh fancy stitches that are on there and uh or if you don't go so close you don't use a button more yeah um and the uh the other thing is is a lot of people buy combo machines which are uh both embroidery and sewing machines and they never end up using the embroidery in it so yeah but you know there are people out there that do have more money than brains and they want the latest i guess maybe it's sort of like people that have to buy the newest car every year and yeah. stuff like that so it applies to that too 
So now this is in reference to uh, my all-star quilt, the one where I put, you know, made them this little oopsie, which is now a customization with two stars together to the same stars together in the top row and two the same in the bottom. And I've changed the name. That's how I fixed the problem. It's now called coupling among the stars uh, with it. But there's a comment here from Lucy. I saw the stars together straight away, but how is that a mistake? Exactly. Why is that a mistake? Well, the original pattern means that they're all individual stars. So yes. That they're, yes but they're two stars next to each other. But so. many people take an original pattern and change the design to suit their wishes. But the only reason it's a mistake is because if you are anally retentive about putting things in symmetrical designs in the whole bit, your logic would dictate that it has to be a different star. You can't have two stars touching each other. Like you can't have the same color of fabric touching each other. But is that a mistake or is it a customization? I'm going with the fact that I didn't make a mistake. I did a customization. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. Never mind. Um, uh, Lucy also had a comment in reference to the Sewers Club box. She says, I've never bought a box. I prefer to choose my material. You're very brave. Thank you for your video. Yeah, I, I never bought a box before this one either because they all came from the States. This was the first Canadian one that I've seen. And um, it is kind of nice to get something like this in the mail once a month. You know, it, it's it's fun to open it in the whole bit. However, Lucy has a point. You just choose your own fabric. But you know, if you're starting out in quilting and you don't have a stash, it's one way to build a stash. And if you're not confident in your choice of colors, because they curate the box so that the fabrics do, to a certain extent, like go together, um, it's it's a way to get around that fear as well until you get more comfortable with all of it. And it's Plus, you might end up getting some stuff that you wouldn't normally pick and then end up, yeah. end up uh, with something that um, you actually end up loving that you didn't think you would be able yeah. to love. But the fact is, they are expensive. I like Sewers Club because you can cancel any time. They have various tiers. Uh, you know, like I get the Fat Quarter uh, Stash Buster box. That's the top uh, in that section. But I don't have to get 15 Fat Quarters. I can drop it down to, I think it's nine and five or something like that, which costs less. You also don't have to get it every month. You can get it every other month. You can get it every quarter. You can get it, uh, you can get it just once and, and then stop it, whatever. So they've built in a lot of flexibility. Some places don't, you're committed that you have to buy so many months. I guarantee that you're going to purchase so many months. So, yeah. Um, now, there was a bunch of comments that came up about growing old. That was on this week's vlog. I was talking about my shoulder, my back, falling to pieces. Yeah. This morning I woke up with an eye that was kind of had a double bag hanging underneath it. I don't know what that's all about. Um, but anyways, falling apart. Uh, but Donna Ritchie wrote, I hope you take, I hope you take with food. And she was talking about Aleve. I mentioned that I was doing some Aleve at night because I found that that helped with my, my shoulder a little bit. She says, Aleve is hard on your kidneys, hard on your stomach too. You only take one every 12 hours. My hub, hubby has bone on bone on his shoulders and was taking four a day. We know someone ruined kidneys from taking them. Did you ever try absorbing junior gel for horses? <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm not a horse. Uh, however, I have heard of absorbing junior because when I was a kid, we had a bottle of absorbing junior uh, in the medicine chest and our, my dad sometimes would spread on smelt horrible smelt like liniment or whatever they call that something kind of thing yeah bag bomb too she says people yeah <laughs> people use it she says try those mustard plaster patches i swear by those it will help i don't like pills well the mustard plaster thing i have my mother used to make mustard plasters when we were kids but that was usually for if we had a chest cold and she'd make this thing and be inside an old tea towel or something and 
you basically made it with dry mustard and something else i think i've got it i think it's in our recipe box because i've made it myself before and it, it creates sort of a heat um and that might might be something to help too with it i don't know it's a home remedy kind of a deal but that's interesting about the aleve um somebody else wrote about aleve and i don't know if i copied that one but they said that for a leaf to be effective, you need to take it for about five or six days in a row. It has to build up. And uh, I don't like taking pills either. So that's why I haven't been doing that, popping it. And uh, it's slowly getting better. Someone said that uh, if you've done something like that, you've pulled uh, ligaments or whatever's up in here, tendons, I don't know, uh, that kind of thing, that it can take like months and months. It's a slow heal kind of a thing um dara said my new gp a general practitioner i guess it is, is heavily dependent on tests she orders up a litany of tests whenever i go in for a physical which really amounts to tests not a physical exam unless i ask her to check something specific the new direction gp medicine has taken on her i have no idea i'm not sure what that the new direction gp medicine has taken on her i have no idea i'm not sure what that means do some yoga Seriously, just a little gentle yoga every morning. Being flexible is so important. Also, the meditative part of the practice is very calming. So there's a plot. She was writing this in what I said. Yeah, I about think a lot of the GPs nowadays uh, don't uh, do uh, the full physical stuff because there's so many people that end up um, saying they're doing something sexual to them or something like mm -hmm. that, that they're um touching them in a way that they're not supposed to be touched so Ooh, doctor usually i have a drink before <laughs> uh i did it i think there's a fear of coming in contact with a patient because of all these problems yeah that that, that um... well i can see that our doctor she's definitely a pill popper and a, and special i know that my girl. doctor when she says she'll say to me I'm going to touch you here. Is that okay? That's what she always does. Oh. So, so I guess, yeah. But anyway, so yeah, yoga. You know, I have thought many times about yoga. I've never done yoga. Um, I don't know. Lots of people do it. I know. It, it, it looks like it's kind of like something that, you know, it doesn't exhaust I think you. one thing it might be good for uh, keeping stretched out. Yeah. Which means you can get rid of wrinkles that way because you just stretch your long leg, you know, elasticize. Well, the senior citizens. No, they don't stretch center, that. Yeah. They don't stretch out like that. <laughs> oh, whatever. Um, the, the senior citizen center, though, they have yoga all the time. Different things. Just a bunch of old people sitting there stretching body parts off. I mean, I don't know. Okay, everybody down. Do the, do the dirty dog. And the next thing you hear is. Woof. Bob, <laughs> but, you know something's dropped off or fell out i don't know yeah. but anyways uh marina also said um there's someone talked about using tylenol or whatever and i don't know what marina's background is whether she's in the medical profession or not but she got very irate with this thing about tylenol so i thought this was interesting she said tylenol is not an anti-inflammatory it's an an anal and analgesic that's the word i want and in brackets she explained it for me pain reliever it works if you take it regularly not just when you pain that's why people say it doesn't work you need the cumulative effect it's being used by elderly after joint replacement and very effective take it regularly every six hours and you will feel relief tylenol is cleared through the liver not kidneys as it's not hard on the stomach so if your liver is in good shape take tylenol the anti-inflammatory is good when first entered for a few days. Ice and heat is good. So, but it's pills. It's pills. And I don't, I take enough pills right now. I don't, I don't like taking these things. Because the other thing too is, I worry about it is, yes, they may work fine and, and give you relief. Then you get hooked on it. You know, you start taking them more. I'd rather have a gummy before I go to bed. They're non-addictive, they're illegal, and they help you sleep, the ones that we have. And they're delicious. They're also delicious. You just eat them like candy. I don't recommend it. 
All right, so now we change the conversation over to in reference to our grow lights and our planting and stuff like that. And Tia, Tia writes, you can do a similar trick to the celery with the ends of lettuce, bok choy, and green onions with carrot tops. Um, if you remember in the video, I showed you I'm trying to grow celery from the end of a celery stalk I bought in the grocery store because I saw it on YouTube. And it is growing. It's now in dirt. So we'll see. I don't know how big it's going to get. I don't know if it's going to survive. I mean, right now it's about this high. But we'll see. But anyways, apparently you can do that with lettuce, bok choy, and green onions. So I think carrot tops. I don't think they'll grow a carrot. No, they won't grow a carrot, but they'll grow the greens. And some oh, yeah. people eat the greens. I'm not yeah. interested in that myself. But uh, in fact, I saw a video. That guy we watched that was in Australia doing all the container gardening and the big 45-gallon plastic drums. He said that about the carrots. Mm -hmm. uh, she says, I haven't tried it with cabbage, but it would possibly work. It could because cabbage has that bottom root. So my celery stalk, it started to grow out from the top and it had root, roots started growing in the bottom. So that was just starting it in water. So I decided the other day I should probably put it in dirt now and see what happens. So that's mm -hmm. what I'm doing. So yeah, there's all kinds of things you can grow from stuff you buy in the grocery yeah. store, you know, kind of a thing. It's all part of the experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, Somebody else wrote, Nancy. Nancy wrote, everything I've gotten has been great, mostly kitchen and garden supplies. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's not about the grow lights anymore. This is about uh, Timu. I was talking about that I ordered some stuff from that place that everybody seems to be ordering from now. That's kind of like Wish, except and sort of like Amazon, but cheaper and I don't know. So I haven't got my stuff yet that I ordered, but I ordered on purpose to do a review to see how it pans out. But anyways, Nancy says everything she's gotten has been great, mostly kitchen and garden supplies is what she's ordered. And uh, Persita said, Timu items are not all junk. I've had some very good items come. If you order, if your if your order will be late, they credit you $5, minimum order of $20, free shipping and free returns. Um yeah, I got free shipping on it, and I did see that about the credit for $5, but I thought it was a Canada Post credit, which I don't know how that really works on it, if the shipping is free. So I don't know. I may have to go back in and read that again, but that's what I thought it said. It was a Canada Post credit. So, don't know. So we'll see. I know there's a lot of reviews about uh, TMU on YouTube, like tons of them. and. Most of the people seem very favorable about them. I am sure there's some stuff that's just crap. Like I ordered some quilting cotton. Okay. 50 squares of quilting cotton for $3.98. You tell me what the quality is going to be like with this. But I did it on as a lark just to see. Um, now there was one comment in reference to Walter. Inez says, he must be working a lot outside. His tan is lovely. Walter, I mean. I don't think I have much of a tan. No, but... I have been outside, though. You do look a little rosy. Yeah. But that's just because you're more red than... I do tend to tan. tan very... Uh, yeah, he does. A lot. It's a swarthy complexion. So as I've gotten older, I don't. I think a tan less. The, the melanin cells melon's aren't gone. working very... Yeah, melanin's gone. But anyways, that was some of the comments people wrote, and we appreciate the comments that you do write. Uh, as I said, I can't, we can't write back to everyone, but I think this is a way every now and then we'll go through some that are, you know, interesting uh, and as points of discussion, and uh, we'll do that. Um, the other thing, too, is I've discovered on YouTube, I don't always get a notification when a comment has been written. Just another one of the quirks in YouTube. Uh, sometimes I do. I have it set up for that. But other times I don't. But I found a section in my YouTube where I can actually see what comments have been written. Uh, and uh, and in some cases, some comments get put into an area waiting for me to review it and whether I'm going to release it or not. And I don't know why, because there's nothing bad in the comment. Like they don't use a swear word. They didn't. It wasn't, you know, hate mail or anything like that. So it must have picked up on something in the algorithm and it stuck it in that area. So sometime if you don't see your comment and you wrote a comment and you're wondering why, maybe I haven't noticed that it was put 
on hold. Um, so I'm going to make a point of checking those a little bit more regularly now that I know that's happening. Okay, so that's it, I think. Do we have anything else in my notes? Notes, notes, I think that takes us to the end of today's episode. It does. So you'll find the link for Sewing with Stephanie and Stephen for next Wednesday in the show notes. You will find the link for the pop-up sewing day this Saturday at 8 a.m. You don't have to come at 8 a.m. whenever you get your face on is there. There is a discount code for any of the boxes that Sewers Club offers. Um, and there's a list for all the videos that went up this past week and whatnot. So lots of things there for you to check out. Okay, that's it. Anything, any parting words of wisdom from Walter? Anything else you want to bring up that I was an idiot doing this week? Walter's never an idiot. He's absolutely perfect. And if he does make a mistake, it's not his fault. Never is his fault. It's his fault. It's always my fault or somebody else's or, you know, he hits his finger driving a nail in with the hammer. Stupid hammer. Bad design. Horrible. Just should never have had it. Might explain why he has a basket full of hammers. <laughs> Anyways, on that note, okay, see some of you tomorrow, maybe, at the pop-up so day, and we'll see the rest of the week, and oh, and Stephen and Walter live on Sunday, as usual. Okay, have a good one. Right. Say goodbye, goodbye Walter. Bye. Bye.